Hello, my name is Mary Sabatino at Gallery Lalong and Co. in New York City. I would like to welcome you to the first conversation in our series, Gallery Lalong Dialogues. Over the next several months, this conversation series will explore topics related to our artists' areas of interest, including socio-political issues, community engagement, opening discussions with artists, curators, and thought leaders for an active audience. Following today's event, Gallery Lalong will host conversations in conjunction with solo exhibitions of works by Mildred Thompson and Tariku Shafaro. Today, we are joined by Alfredo Jar and Koyo Kuo. Koyo is the executive director and the chief curator at the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art in South Africa, where, it, where a solo exhibition of Alfredo Jar's work the Rwanda project is currently on view. So I'd like to just tell you a tiny bit about these two luminaries who I'm sure many of our audience already knows. Koyo is the executive director and the chief curator at the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art in Africa. He founded Raw Material Company in Dakar in 2008 as an institution dedicated to knowledge, society, and art. In her independent curatorial practice, she has organized many meaningful and timely exhibitions, such as Body Talk, Feminism, Sexuality, and the Body in the works of six African women. She has participated in the 57th Carnegie International with the researched Dig Where You Stand, which included works from the collections of the Carnegie's Museum of Art and Natural History. She was initiator of the research project, Saving Bruce Lee, African and Arab Cinema in an Era of Soviet Cultural Diplomacy, and she, which was co-curated with Rasha Salti at the Garage Museum in Moscow. Prior to founding RAW, Koyo worked in cultural affairs with the Goethe Institute, the Gore Institute, and the U.S. Embassy in Senegal. Thank you, Koyo, for joining us from Cape Town today. Thank Alfredo you. Jar, yeah. sorry. Um, Alfredo Jar, an artist, an architect, and a filmmaker. Alfredo has been in four Venice Biennales, two Documentas, and three Sao Paulo Biennales. I'm counting the upcoming one. His individual exhibitions include the New Museum of Contemporary Art, the White Chapel, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and the Moderna Musit in Stockholm. He's also had major surveys of his work at the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Lausanne, at the Hangar Bicocca, Milan, at the Alta Gallery in Berlin, and at the Chiasma Helsinki and Yorkshire Sculpture Park, and now at Zeitz in South Africa. Alfredo has realized more than 70 public interventions. He is a Guggenheim Fellow, a MacArthur Fellow. He has received the Hiroshima Art Prize and the Hasselblad Award in 2020. And I've been privileged to work with Alfredo since 1993. Our first exhibition was Real Pictures after your Rwanda project. So um, I will be back to uh, give the audience questions, a time for questions. Please put your questions in the chat and thank you for joining us. Now enjoy. Well, this is us now. Hello, Alfredo. <laughs> Hello. Can you guys hear me? Alfredo, you're muted. Okay. Yes, now I'm fine. Hello, Koyo. Okay. I'm very happy to be here with you. Well, always happy to be with you, even digitally. So um, I think that, uh, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Galerie Lelon. Thank you, audience, for tuning in. I think that uh, I would like to show you a very short clip to give you a sense of the, of the exhibition in um, in uh, in Cape Town, and uh, and then Alfredo and I will go on into talking about the works and the context of the exhibition, the content of the exhibition, and more. Thank you.
for showing the film. Yeah, thank you. This is it. Uh, it's the show has been put up finally in uh, in November, and uh, uh, initially we were supposed to to uh, uh, open this show in March 2020, just uh, uh, a week after a uh, uh, South African lockdown, and it's always uh, and I've been here back in South Africa now for four months, and it's always so extremely deeply moving to walk through that show uh, almost every day. Uh, but I wanted, before I give the word to Alfredo to, to start uh, walking everybody through the essence of that, of that exhibition and the, uh, and the works included in it, I think that it is important for me to, to sort of send out uh, as a, not as a, a disclaimer, but just as an information that the Rwandan genocide was a, was a very, very complex issue. Uh, around ethnic divisions and uh, historically created, unfortunately, and uh, uh, by, you know, uh, the colonial enterprise of dividing uh, uh, the continent in many ways. So unequal occupation of land, population density, high unemployment, uh, food insecurity, a lot of things that, you know, multiple failed coup, coup attempts before 
the major, I mean, the genocide that is the, the kind of the, the, the body of the, of uh, the content of this body of work. Uh, the, the, the tipping point, which was uh, the, the assassination of uh, the, the former Rwanda president, Juvenel Habyarimana, on, on April 6 in 1994, was really just the tip of a huge iceberg that was going, uh, that was circulating since many decades. So it is important that people understand that it was not just, you know, uh, an ethnic group standing up and, and massacre and slaughtering another ethnic group. So there is, there is a lot that, uh, that preceded the, those atrocious events. Alfredo. Yeah, thank you very much, Koyo. So as, uh, as was said, I would like to take you around the exhibition slowly, uh, giving you a small introduction to each one of the works and then we'll engage in a, in a dialogue with Koyo about each of them. And at the end of, the, of this little journey, we'll have a conversation and you're invited to join us. So if I may, I will uh, share my screen with you. I don't see my screen, sorry, hold on a second. Okay, I hope you, you have uh, my screen in, uh, in uh, full screen. Do you, Koyo? Yes, we see, Koyo. yes. Thank I you, see. thank you. So uh, before I start with this little presentation of the work in the museum, I would like to make a plea. And this is about 15 million African men and women that died of AIDS in the 80s and 90s. And if they died, it was because the drug and pharmaceutical conglomerates did not want to share the copyrights on the HIV drugs. And it took them between 15 and 20 years before sharing the copyright. And during that time, almost 15 million Africans died of AIDS. And I'm afraid that we are in a situation where history might repeat itself if these international drug companies that, are, that have created the COVID vaccine do not share the copyrights and allow African labs to produce the vaccine in the continent. So this is my urgent plea to these drug companies to not repeat the horrific criminal mistake of the 90s regarding the COVID crisis. This is the, uh, the first space in the museum. The installation of the project was done via Zoom. Uh, I wanna thank Carlos uh, Marcia from the Goodman Gallery. I wanna thank the Goodman Gallery for supporting the, the project. And I wanna thank uh, Mark Bongarten to direct in directing the engineers and the installers in Cape Town via Zoom during hours and hours. And the result is actually, actually absolutely extraordinary. It's one of the most beautiful installations we have made, made of this work. So the first work we see is a, is a small video. It's a very short video that only lasts one minute and it's called Embrace. I'm gonna share it with you. In Embrace, we see three kids looking at something 
that is outside of the frame that you will not see. And slowly, we see the body language. We see the movement. Each image is on the screen for only 15 seconds. And what we see is that they are expressing love, solidarity, pain, all the things that the so-called international community failed to express. So it's a very simple video that just lasts one minute with four different images. And I didn't want to share with the audience what they're looking at because that's what the, most of the media does. I just wanted to focus on their body language. And I felt that everything you need to know about the genocide is right there in this body language. Alfredo, this particular work, I think, really uh, encapsulates a lot of things that um, is very at, uh, how can I put it? It's very real now. We talk about grief a lot and grievance which is also the title of uh, a posthumous uh, exhibition of Oakley that is currently in New York. Um, I really want to, to ask you, how do you think that this image or images of so-called humanitarian crisis really inhabit the conceptual and aesthetic space? What I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at for you to, to, to talk about how did you orchestrate or organize the documentary reportage that is part of the language that you're using in this work and the artistic process, as well as the social visibility. And at the same time, succeed, you succeed in resisting the spectacle of violence. That is really, quite extraordinary to achieve. Thank you, Goyo. Well, I, I went to Rwanda in August 94, before the genocide, genocide has, had ended. And my mission, my objective was to witness and to express solidarity because the international community was looking the other way while a million people were killed in less than a hundred days. And that indifference of the so-called world community I felt was barbaric. And I needed to see and I needed to express my solidarity myself with the people of Rwanda. But that's all I wanted to do. I didn't have any preconception of what I was going to do. So what I did was to meet people, to talk to people and to photograph everything I was witnessing. Absolutely everything, the massacre sites, the survivors, the landscape, the NGOs working in, in makeshift hospitals, helping people, et cetera, et cetera. So I accumulated a, an obscene amount of images and videos. And I returned to New York totally destroyed morally and physically and psychologically. And it took me a little more than half a year to decide what could possibly be done with this material, with this image. And of course, in, in reaction to what I had seen the media do or not do, then I created these exercises that what I call these exercises in representation. Mm. I'll uh, move on if you, I may. Sure. To, uh, another work that's here in the, in the first room next to Embrace. And it's here on the left side, it's called Untitled Newsweek. And uh, these are 17 covers of Newsweek magazine from the moment the genocide started until 17 weeks after they finally decided to put 
the Rwandan genocide on the cover. This is what I meant by the criminal indifference of the world media. They showed different types of covers like the death of Nixon on April 30, 1984, where you had already 100,000 deaths and every hour, 250,000 refugees were crossing the border and 1.3 million Rwandans had, had fled their homes. In June 10, this is the cover they had when they had already 600,000 dead in Rwanda. It's obscene, it's truly obscene. Then in July 21st, 1994, 1 million people had been killed. 2 million had fled the country and another two were displaced within Rwanda. And Newsweek was talking about Mars. Was talking about Mars. And finally, on August 1st, 1994, Newsweek magazine dedicated its first cover to Rwanda. And it was a lie. It says, racing against death in Rwanda. And it's a lie because the race was over. There were already a million dead people. It was too late. I think that this particular work is for me uh, and a very strong, uh, how can I put it? Presentation or visualization of something that is not visible, but that is so effective in, 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 uh, in global society and particularly in Western and particularly in American society when it comes to Black experience, Black existence, and uh, Black bodies in a, in, a, in a certain way. And I am convinced that every viewer has a different reading of, uh, of Untitled Newsweek. What I see in, uh, uh, in this work, and each time I look at it, it's the same thing that really also comes to, comes to a fore, is that um, the, 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 the violence of, of, um, of, how can I put it, uh, the value placed on white and black lives is not the same. Uh, although, of course, both equally important, what you see is multiple headlines about the O.J. Simpson case that was also in, uh, uh, in 94. Uh, that was highly televised in a way that became, for me as an African woman, looking at that process, uh, that trial from, I was in Cameroon back then, I remember very well. Uh, it was not necessarily, from my point of view, the value placed on OJ's guilt, on OJ's life, but more on Nicole Simpson's an individual white woman's life. So highly publicized whilst all this is going on. And as you said, uh, so this work is, is very poignant for me. It's, uh, uh, it really says everything without, without many words. And, and somehow, maybe a question to you, I think, uh, how does that timeline that you use in, uh, in making this work become for you, in a way, a marker of, uh, of denial of the survivors of the, you know, of the, of the grief, of the, of the atrocities that, that, that are going on? How did that, you know, how do you uh, compare it also, of course, how the magazine uh, are portraying this and how on and on and only how, and in relation to the, the pe perpetrators on the one hand and the victims on the other? 
Thank you. Um, Koyo, unfortunately, this denial that exists in this work is just the normal in most of Western media regarding African events. The media landscape, the Western media landscape is, is the place where we could do similar works every day of our lives. And it is that context that allows for these killings and genocides and horrific events to happen. Because it is out there in this media landscape. Now this work was done with 17 weeks of the magazine cover, but it was in, on May 6, 1994, exactly a month after the genocide started that I decided to go to Rwanda. Mm. On that day, the New York Times had a, uh, a piece on Rwanda on page six. And it was a little story where they mentioned very casually about an event in Rwanda. And at the end of the article, they mentioned something like, and this body count doesn't take into account 35,000 bodies that had already washed into the shore of Lake Victoria in Uganda. The rage I felt when I read that line is the one that brought me to Rwanda. But if I went only in August, it's because I couldn't get the permit to get there. They wouldn't let me go in until a friend of mine who was a journalist uh, helped me with a journalist pass. And I had to, f to sign a release that I would be responsible for my own life. And I couldn't make the United Nations or any country responsible for what happened to me. So for me, uh, this lasted until May, but, but the magazine went on with its criminal indifference until August 1st, 1994. This is a neon that is not, was not created between 94 and 2000, which is where I created the, the Rwanda project. This, work, this neon was created only last year, no, in 19, uh, I mean, 2019, two years ago. I wanted to, uh, to express my feelings about Rwanda. This is pre-COVID. This is December, uh, November, 2019. I wanted to express my feelings about Rwanda 25 years later. And I've always liked this poem by um, Anna Hagmatova, the Russian poet. And, and I've always identified with it at many moments of my life. And perhaps today, even again, because of the COVID pandemic. It says so much to do today, kill memory, kill pain, turn heart into a stone and yet prepare to live again. I can't say more about this because I think poetry is the, is the strongest kind of uh, uh, medium that human beings can use to express the unexpressible, if you want, or describe the undescribable. Um, yeah, it's just simply powerful. However, uh, I think that uh, I, I would have a, a, a slight question here around uh, neon signs and uh, how does that the contemporaneity and the very kind of uh, uh, very recognizable language of contemporary art to neon works, text and color that you use in uh, in this particular work uh, what were you what were you thinking what were you trying to to convey that is beyond the words that that we can read in this uh, in this uh, strophe if i can say it like that yeah thank you in this case i wanted a kind of burning text 
and uh, and the the cables and the transformers and the light were all the devices I felt that could be interesting to animate this this so powerful text mm. to bring um, all the emotions from the Rwanda experience. Uh, into the present and into that space. Next to it, uh, on that same space, we might be going a little slow, so I'm gonna go a little faster, but mm -hmm. there is a, a, a graphic work of uh, postcards of the United Nations building in New York. These are all assembly spaces and rooms where the United Nations meet to take decisions about the world. And I just use a letter set to write the word Rwanda 1994 on top of these images of empty spaces. Mm -hmm. And this is in reference to the fact that the uh, General Dallaire from Canada, who was in charge of the uh, United Nations forces in Rwanda before the genocide started, sent a fax to the Security Council, mm. explaining that he has heard about a genocide coming and he would like the authorization to stop it. And the 15 members of the Security Council met and they gave the orders to withdraw from, from Rwanda instead of acting and stopping the genocide. Mm. It was a scandal. And this work makes reference to that. Mm. If I may move on. Yes, continue, please. Good. Then we go into a hallway where we plastered uh, the wall with a poster that I created in 1994 that simply says Rwanda, 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 eight times with bold Helvetica letters. There are, there are no names, no phone numbers, no information. It's like a cry that I wanted to share with the audience. This poster was displayed in a small city in Sweden called Malmo. Mm. Uh, they offered me 50 light boxes all around the city. And I wasn't ready at that time because I had just come back from Rwanda. I wasn't ready to, to, to show any work from Rwanda. And I came up with this idea without images, without text. It was a cry, a very public cry. And because the light boxes were donated to me, some of them were in locations that were not very visible, very commercial. And so you have uh, this example where this light box is here under this tree and there is very few people because this is a, a residential area with very little foot traffic. But I felt it was appropriate. I felt this, the kind of solitude of these signs in the streets were parallel, were referencing the solitude of the Rwandan people on the world stage. I also think in this particular work here, I mean, which is so sensitive and so delicate, you also consider, I mean, as a, as a, as a visual artist and the way you work, you also consider here, yeah, I felt like you really considered the proliferation and the oversaturation of media landscape of violent images. You, you are really resisting this uh, uh, spectacle of violence and uh, but at the same time that sometimes very very often not just sometimes but most most often uh, leads to a, a form of desensitization you know towards uh, the, the the subject matter towards the victims or the survivors in this in this context so uh, so through this textual repetition that also uh, employ some form of uh, prop propagandist models with, you know, the repetition, the letter typeset that is used, uh, uh, the cry, 
uh, it is a, was really a, a very uh, interesting and strong way to 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 make to raise awareness about about Rwanda. Thank you. I didn't know it at the time, but yes, this became almost like the model of what I would do later. I, I the refusal of to show the images to share them with the audience to try to do something else. But this was a very spontaneous um, gesture because I wasn't given much time. I was offered this in November and, and we did it in December. But as you said, here's the seed of what was coming, the refusal of to fall into this, this, this pornography of violence and, and a victimization of the Rwanda spectacle in the media. Which we will see very clearly in the next work. Yes. And the next work is, is also very early on, right after uh, Rwanda, 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 and it's called Real Pictures. And here, I'm displaying monuments to the people of Rwanda. These are black archival boxes that contain photographs that I took in Rwanda of the genocide, of the murders, of the killings, and of the survivors. But these images are in black boxes that are normally used to archive photographs. But these boxes are closed. And on top of each one of these boxes, I have, I have seal screen, a text that describes the image inside. So here, I'm inviting people to walk around this memorial space and to read this text. The strategy here was the following. Because I felt that the images of the killing did not make any effect on anybody, no one decided to act in the face of the killings. It was as if no one had seen these images of killings. So I felt that perhaps by hiding these images, now you will see them better. So it was a very twisted, absurd logic. But I must say that it's not only hiding them. Hiding is, is just one, let's say, superficial aspect of this work. I'm not only hiding them. I'm really preserving these images, preserving them for a future where society, our contemporary society would be capable of looking at these images and acting upon them. It's interesting that you say that, and this is the power of art. You know, it's, it allows so many multiple interpretations. What I see here is, is rather the, you know, the maybe the impossibility of, you know, representing the real magnitude of, of the trauma and of the events that happened and, and, and the continuation of your resistance exactly to, to participate in a spectacle of violence, to really, uh, uh, how do you say that, to really reckon with the fact that real life is always, you know, uh, more powerful, stronger than, than fiction or whatever representation we can make of it. So that impossibility of representing, I think it very, comes very powerful, uh, come out very powerful here in Real Pictures. Absolutely. And that's when uh, I declared that uh, that this was an exercise in representation, trying to represent something that I felt was unrepresentable. And that's when uh, I decided to call all the following uh, works as exercises in representation. Then we move on to another work that welcome us with a, a line of illuminated text. And uh, that tells the story of a young child called Endu Wayesu, who witnessed how his parents were killed in front of his eyes with machetes. And this kid became silent 
and could not speak for six weeks. That's when I met him in an orphanage and I photographed him and I struggled for two years. How could I tell the story of Enduayesu whose silence also metaphorically represented the silence of the so-called international community in the face of this criminal uh, tragedy. So after the spectator reads the text, you will move into a second space where you will encounter a very large light table that measures around four by six meters, on top of which you will find almost a million slides. And all around the table, you will find loops, magnifiers, inviting you to take a slide and to look at the images. And when you do that, you will quickly discover that you will see a single image repeated a million times, the eyes of Enduayesu, who witness the horror that we refuse to witness. In this work, I wanted to create a balance between information and poetry, information and content. It was very important for me to reduce the tragedy of one million people dead to one person, to one story. This way you reduce the scale of the event and people can feel empathy and can solidarize and empathize with the victim. And, and so the information is in the written text, illuminated text at the beginning that explain what this image is. And because we know what that image means, we cannot dismiss it. And so this is a very difficult balance to reach between information and poetry. And it, I've never reached the perfect balance, but in my view, this is where I'm getting as close as, as I can. This is called the silence of Enduwa, yes. It is, we usually think that, I mean, we, we usually tr try or try to stay away from the single story because the single story is a story that we consider not doesn't read uh, doesn't convey the full picture and the single story is a story usually that doesn't include the multiple layers and facets of of a story However, I think that it is one of those rare occasions where a single story uh, very well embodies the essence of a mass tra tragedy like the Rwandan genocide. So, um, and I will also want to uh, uh, underline here that children were absolutely not spared in the Rwandan genocide. In the contrary, they were part of the systematic uh, slaughtering and, and, uh, and killing, and particularly young boys, because the, the oppressors were concerned about them being able to flee and, and grow up and come back as as uh, uh, as a uh, revenge so uh child, young boys and young girls were actually systematically uh targeted for 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 killings which is uh, the horrible uh truth of uh, of this random genocide yes that's correct they the killers actually mentioned it so many times in their cries for killing they said, let's not repeat the mistake from the early 90s where they killed thousands of uh, Tutsis. And this time they wanted to kill the kids also. Uh, the next work before the last work is a, is a triptych video where uh, we hear the voice of the survivors 
they tell truly horrific stories about how they survived, what they went through. But the essence of this video is really to show the hypocrisy of President Clinton that a few years after the genocide went to Rwanda, supposedly to pay homage to the victims. But what he really did, didn't even go into Rwanda. He stayed at the airport and he did a speech that was pathetic, totally disgusting, disgusting, where he said, he affirmed that he had no idea that the genocide were, was happening. And so he apologized to the Rwandan people for not knowing and thus not acting. While we all know that the State Department was demanding that the press in the United States never use the word genocide, because once it's established that the genocide is occurring, then the countries that form part of the United Nations must intervene to stop it. So he took care of that and he made sure that the word genocide never showed up in the press for many months because he didn't want to intervene. And so the spectacle of him talking about not knowing in the airport of Kigali, not even in the city, not even in a cemetery, not even in a memorial, but in the, in the airport was just too much. Yeah, this work is, uh, is particularly telling of, you know, I call it the lay of the land, which is a phrase that I use a lot recently. And or someone else would maybe say the state of affairs and the state of affairs uh, are still more or less the same. We, we've seen it through the last 2020 has shown us also in, uh, in many ways beyond COVID, the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter protest uh, and more. And, uh, and in this work particularly, I think that uh, you really ask the viewer to, 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 to ponder about the possibility of this uh, denial, basically. It's, it's a massive global denial that was orchestrated. Uh, can I say on purpose? I don't know. Can I say no, knowingly? For sure. Uh, but it is a repetition of, you know, the same treatment that is reserved to African affairs of this, of this style. So, um, and the title we wish to inform you that we didn't know and is, uh, is just so, so uh, appropriate in a way that at the same, when one considered that, for instance, the international tribunal, uh, criminal tribunals of, uh, of uh, about Rwanda were officially closed in 2015, and that after the genocide, the global uh, community, of course, participated and orchestrated the persecution of, uh, of the oppressors. I think that it is such a, um, uh, Denial is not even a word, but such a hypocrisy to really uh, witness and assist in the mass slaughtering and massacre, global massacre, and not do anything. And participate, of course, later in the, uh, all the processes of uh, reconciliation, persecution, and so on. So you bring the, the, the viewer into a, a, a kind of a dilemma, I think, how to understand this and how to, how to, how to deal with this, 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 uh, this situation. Do you, do you understand what I mean? What I'm Absolutely. trying to say is uh, the same people that were not uh, 
awake enough, that we're not alert enough, or that we're not uh, concerned enough when everything was happening, are the same people who orchestrate the kind of post-traumatic care, so to speak. I agree, Koyo. It's a very sad reality of our times. And the last work in the exhibition is a, is a quite large space with a single light box, as you can see there. And the exit is on the right side. And this light box is called, is titled Six Seconds. And this is a girl I met in a refugee camp. And I had been told that uh, she had witnessed the death of her parents. And she was quite uh, disturbed. And I wanted to talk to her. So I approached her. And when I reached her, she, she was really, uh, she was not in the state and she was not able to speak. So before I even started talking to her, she turned around and left. And I don't know why, because I, I normally don't do that, but automatically I, I moved my finger to my little camera that I have hanging, I had hanging on my, on my neck and I push the button. And this is the image that came through. This is uh, August, 1994. And for six years, while I was working on the Rwanda project, I would periodically go back to this image. And I found it incredibly beautiful. The composition, the colors, everything. But I, I couldn't use it because it was out of focus. Uh, as an architect, I'm very uh, rigorous and very um, Cartesian. And my Cartesian mind did not allow me to, to use this image, even though I was aware of its beauty and the content. This was a survivor. We, could, we were not showing her face, so it was perfect. I'm not revealing who she is. I was keeping her, 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 her identity a secret. There is an image of, 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 of being lost in, in this landscape. But I, my, my, my architect's brain could not accept to use an image out of focus until the year 2000. That's when I came up with the, the realization that perhaps I had found the image that would be the image from the Rwanda project, the manifesto for the Rwanda project. And I, and I thought to myself, but Alfredo, of course, everything you do about people that you don't know and you want to tell that story to other people that you don't know. That's what we do as artists. Well, so necessarily, everything you do is out of focus. So this is it. Everything you do is out of focus. So this is the image of the Rwanda project. And, and I came up with this idea in 2000, and I created this work called Six Seconds, which Six Seconds is the the time that I think that I, I, I was able to, to be with her before she left me. I like this work a lot, if one can like any of the works actually made uh, out of uh, this uh, series about Rwanda. Um, I think that uh, the formal qualities uh, of the work really spoke really to the distortion and the breakdown of communication really between yourself and the subject. And the very fact that this young girl sort of denied herself to you or refused herself 
I mean, you know, turned her back on you, didn't want you to photograph her. Uh, for me, it's also a kind of uh, 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 another refusal of the, the historicity of, uh, of the photograph and also the legibility of it. The very fact that it is out of focus makes it very legible in, uh, uh, in many ways. Uh, and uh, it, it also provokes uh, really questions about uh, the nature of photography or of the photograph as, a, as an intrusive uh, uh, as instrument in itself of as an, in, as an instrument that could also be an instrument, an instrument of violence itself. So I will ask you uh, a, a very uh, tough question maybe. How does this photograph really implicate you uh, uh, as an artist and the viewer in these complicated, very ambivalent ways in relations to the idea about the power of photography? Because you, you think about photography a lot as uh, in your practice and you constantly say that you are not a photographer, you happen to be uh, making photographs and you insist on making and not taking. So how do you, how do, what would you say about that in the context of, uh, of six seconds? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. You have formulated beautifully. Uh, I totally agree. I'm, I'm implicated fully. This is something that uh, I will never negate. And I'm, and I'm perfectly aware. But the, the question I'm, I may ask in, in response is, do we have a choice? Should we condemn these events to complete invisibility because I'm not African, because I live in New York, because I, I am from Chile? Should I just ignore everything that's happening around me because I am not one of them. Well, that's the, the, the real issue here. And I've always decided very early on in my career, in my practice, that as an architect, I want to respond to the context, to the context of the world around me. And I'm not gonna ignore anything happening around me. And I will respond to that context. So when I felt that the world was looking the other way and I went to Rwanda, this was probably the most crazy decision I had taken in my life. I had to respond. And, and Koyo, the, the concept I, I like to, to use when I'm asked this kind of question is the concept of making mistakes. Uh, it's a concept uh, created by Heiner Müller, an East German writer that I have followed for a long time that I like very much. This idea of that you're aware that you're going to make a mistake, but you still make it because it is still important to make it. So instead of condemning these realities, these horrific realities to invisibility because I have nothing to do with this, no. I'm gonna get in, involved and I'm gonna make the mistake of trying to say, to say something. Mm. And I know it's a mistake, but perhaps, perhaps I will communicate something to the audience and perhaps things might change. Thank you so much, Alfredo. I think that You've said it all, we've said it all. This body of work is, uh, is, goes under your skin. I have the privilege of living with it since uh, November. And actually uh, I'll have the privilege of living with it for a full year because we just decided due to many uh, different reasons about how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the museum to extend all our exhibitions for, for a year. So uh, the Rwanda project will be uh, in the museum 
on the way until October this year. So, uh, and we will certainly have more programming with you, uh, Alfredo, uh, around the, the project because we had planned to to hold a, a symposium around trauma and uh, and how it affects uh, uh, contemporary art practice, uh, particularly. And uh, yeah, so. Thank so, you. Thank you, Coyo, and uh, thank you, um, Alfredo. You both uh, answered actually many questions that the uh, audience put. So on behalf of Alfredo and Coyo, I want to thank you. Thank you, our audience, for joining this on our inaugural conversation of Gallery La Longue Dialogues. Um, Alfredo and Coyo, I think you both touch so much on what is trauma and to take uh, what is trauma, how is it possible to represent uh, these terrible, terrible events and what do we risk when we do that? So, you know, thank you both and thank you also for sharing how we can prepare to live again, to take the quote from Alfredo's uh, uh, text. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. So next week, Wednesday at 2 p.m., please join us for the second in the series, Expanding the Legacy of Mildred Thompson, uh, on the occasion of her solo exhibition. Melissa Messina, curator of the Mildred Thompson Estate, will moderate a discussion with Adrienne Nivevis, founder of Tessera Arts Collective, and Lauren Jackson Harris and Darcia Mia DeMar, founders of Black Women and the Visual Artists. So, from all of us, thank you. And um, as courage and light to all of you, and thank you, Koyo, for sending that as your signature in your email today. So, thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.